Coming to feminine voice is our topic for today. Not a lot of feminine voices in the Corpus Hermeticum. And here we're going to have to turn to Gnosticism. And uh, as part of this, we should talk about a few things. One of them is the idea of messengers of light as it comes down through Gnostic literature. <clears throat> and the idea here is that as with Hermeticism in general, the ultimate God or big mystery or what have you is not gendered, but it can express itself in the form of sex and gender. Uh, sometimes, but all across the range, all across the spectrum, it's fluid. And so uh, there is, however, especially in Gnosticism, a tradition where feminine aspects of the divinity manifest in various forms. And in many Gnostic stories, these are the ones who create culture and give us wisdom. And in some of the Gnostic tales, I'll get to one in a moment, actually rewrite the Genesis story so that it's Eve rather than Adam, who is the source of wisdom and redemption. Now, in the Gospel of Mary, as one example, uh, this is one of several uh, Gnostic texts where Mary Magdalene is presented as the, the companion teacher, the, the, the bright student, also um, the co-teacher, let me put it that way, of Jesus. And uh, in this text, Jesus has died and been crucified. And Mary and three male disciples are having a private conversation about what to do. And it's clear right from the beginning that the male disciples are lost. They're lost and they're hopeless. They don't know what to do. And one of them actually says, well, what's gonna happen if we go and tell people about what he taught us? They're gonna do to us what they did to him. And, and then what, you know? And so Mary's the one as a natural leader who steps forward and says, take heart. Look at what he gave us. Look at everything that we have, take heart. And in doing this, she is behaving like one of all the female messengers of light, one of them is Noria, who is either the sister or the daughter of Noah, depending on the, the story. Uh, these strong women who are directly linked somehow to Barbilo, who's one of the feminine or, or fluid faces of God. So down through Barbilo to Sophia, to Eve, and then there's other ones too. Um, but it's a, it's, think of it as, a chain of light reaching from heaven to earth. And it's, it's the women on earth who carry this forward more than the men in, in the Gnostic tales. And in Gnostic circles in general, there was an equality that was missing from the Christianity, especially the Romanized Christianity that would replace Gnosticism. So in Gnostic study circles, women led them as often as men, for instance. Um, and those circles not only read stories, but they interpreted dreams. They did a lot of what we would now think of as experiential work, which was something that the early church fathers complained about. One of them wrote that he was frustrated because all the women were leaving his, his circle, which would, was kind of a proto-Christian circle, and they were all going over to the Gnostics. I wonder why. And um, so, Mary is one of that part, one of that tradition, one of those seers, and she's heartening the, the disciples. And uh, at one point, uh, one of them asks, did, did he share with you, did Jesus share esoteric knowledge, we would call it now, that he didn't share with us? And she says, yes, he did. And so she describes this spiritual ascent that she made. And in, at each phase of it, there are seven phases, she encounters an archon, um, a, a spiritual power that's determined to stop her. And as I've said elsewhere, they're kind of like uh, threshold guardians and you have to be able to respond to them and disidentify with them. They're like a little bit, if we consider them from a purely psychological angle, they're like complexes. Doesn't do any good to repress them um, and, and working through them doesn't always help you have to outgrow them as Jung pointed out. So Mary describes exactly how to do that. And the middle piece of the, of the text is missing. 
but we have a pretty good sense of where it went from looking at other Gnostic texts and how they describe the visionary ascent. <clears throat> so the one of like one of the powers is wrath as an archetypal power. And it's interesting that it's wrath because Peter in this story and in other Gnostic stories too, is the one who's got an anger problem, especially toward Mary. So once she details the ascent, the, the, the two of the male disciples, Peter and Andrew, repay her by distrusting her. And, they, and Andrew says, I do not believe that the Savior told this woman these things. And at that point, Levi actually takes Mary's side and, and says to Peter, you know, wrath is your whole problem. <laughs> so when you look at this in, in terms of who inherited the church, it becomes interesting and complex. So um, Karen King is a Gnostic scholar who has written about the Gospel of Mary. And I wanted to read a little bit of what she said about the implications of this text. The Gospel of Mary was written at a time when the truth of Christian teaching could not be settled by appeal to a commonly accepted rule of faith or canon of gospel literature, let alone an established leadership. The Gospel of Mary framed the issue as a matter of character. Who can be relied on to preach the gospel? The argument for the truth of its teaching is based on a contrast between Mary's character and Peter's. Peter represents the error of assuming that simply having heard the teachings of Jesus is enough to ensure that one has actually understood it. And in another place, Karen King talks about how this sort of creative writing of in the gospel genre um, is a form of resistance to different kinds of authority, Roman, patriarchal, and others. It's, it's a form of correcting an injustice through what the Gnostics probably held as fictional. They're, they're troublemakers through storytelling. <laughs> so in their stories, there's many strong figures, um, women, but also goddesses who show up and they correct imbalances and injustices. And so <clears throat> let me give you a, a glance at another one. And this would be Eve, um, who has been famously disparaged throughout uh, religious history. But the Gnostics had a very different take on Eve. So there's a Gnostic text called On the Origin of the World, and it's one of the oldest Gnostic texts. And I wanted to read you something from that. So imagine Adam laying on the ground because he, he has no spirit, basically. Um, he's been created. He has, he has material existence, but no spirit. And uh, the archons have come along and kind of let the air out of him. And so Eve shows up. And Eve is directly connected with Sophia and Barbilo and God. And so it says, when Eve saw Adam cast down, she pitied him. And she said, Adam, live. Rise up upon the earth. Immediately, her word became a deed. For when Adam rose up, immediately he opened his eyes. When he saw her, he said, you will be called the mother of the living because you are the one who gave me life. One other passage about Eve comes from the secret book of John, also known as the Apocryphon of John. It's considered a, a core text of Gnosticism. If you were to set aside maybe five or six texts as the Gnostic texts, that would be one of them. And so in this text, Eve is talking about herself. And she says, he who hears, let him arise from the deep sleep. And then Adam wept and shed tears. He spoke asking, who is it that calls my name? And whence has this hope come upon me while I am in the chains of this prison? And I, Eve, spoke thus, I am the foreknowledge of pure light. I am the thought of the undefiled spirit. Arise and remember and beware of the deep sleep. 
when she calls herself foreknowledge, she's directly referencing the higher aspects of feminine divinity in the Gnostic pantheon. She's, she's in effect tracing her spiritual lineage all the way back to its root. And deep, deep sleep was a Gnostic way of saying unconsciousness, collective unconsciousness. Don't, don't fall asleep and just become one of the masses. Be your true self. Uh, Barbilo herself, who is uh, pretty much the, you could think of her as the, the interiority of the divine or the first expression of the divine in our cosmos. Uh, there are stories where Barbilo is the one who makes descents to our world so that she can help us get along because we're under constant assault by archons who show up as political and religious powers. So when you look at heads of mega churches or just big religious organizations, most of the Gnostics of that time would have seen them as archons, as under the sway of archons. And so Barbilo helps us deal with that by refocusing us on ourselves and our direct link to the divine and helps us find each other too and support each other. So there are stories about that as well. So it's been said that some of the passages in the Gnostic texts where the feminine power describes herself uh, sound a lot like Isis talking about herself in the Egyptian literature. And that's true, that that's where they got the form for it. <clears throat> it's a kind of gender, gender um, uh, uh, what's a good way of saying this? It's a gendered way of talking about the power of the divine feminine. That's what I'm looking for. And so one of the texts that do this in the Gnostic world is called Thunder. And it goes by different names, The Thunder or Thunder Perfect Mind. And you can actually look up copies of it online. And I want to re recommend, by the way, a really good site for texts, gnosis.org, gnosis.org. It's run by my colleague, Lance Owens. And he has put together not only Gnostic texts, but uh, a rich collection of Hermetic texts in general, and also some of the patristic literature as well, bearing on this. So I want to read you uh, some passages actually from Thunder, Perfect Mind. It's um, a Gnostic text in which we're not sure exactly which feminine power is speaking. Um, so a lot of people have said it's Sophia talking. You have to remember that in terms of the Gnostic tales, it effectively doesn't make much of a difference. It can be Eve talking. Um, uh, it could be Barbilo talking. Um, it could be uh, Forethought, who's also a feminine principle um, who emanates from the divine. <clears throat> Any one of them, but they're, they're all linked. They're all different feminine faces of the one God. And so I'll give you a piece of this just to give you kind of the sense and mood of what this must have meant, not only to people who were able to read it at that time, but to hear it being spoken. And in the Gnostic stories, the power of voice is emphasized in hermetic stories in general, but particularly the feminine voice and the changes it can make in the world and the strength that it has <clears throat> and its connection to the divine. So I'll, I'll read you a bit of that. I was sent forth from the power and I have come to those who reflect upon me and I have been found among those who seek after me. Look upon me, you who reflect on me and you hearers hear me. You who are waiting for me, take me to yourselves and do not banish me from your sight. And do not make your voice hate me, nor your hearing. Do not be ignorant of me anywhere or at any time. Be on your guard, do not be ignorant of me. For I am the first and the last. I am the honored and the scorned one, the whore and the holy one, the wife and the virgin, the mother and the daughter. I am she whose wedding is great, and I have not taken a husband. I am the midwife, and she who does not bear. I am the solace of my labor pains. Let me interrupt just to point out um, this 
bringing together of the opposites is something that appears in a lot of hermetic literature, but they're not always held as opposites. They're more, it's more like a polarity. Uh, these are seen as different aspects of the cosmos and of experienced life as we actually live it that are always in relation to each other. And so the deities reflect that sense of wholeness. And in, in Gnostic cosmology in particular, they live in a realm called the Pleroma, which literally means wholeness or abundance. So it's not a split version of an all good deity pitted against an all evil one. Uh, as in many other cultures, the view of divinity here is that divinity is capable of holding all the cosmic tensions within itself. So to continue, I am the one who is disgraced and the great one. Give heed to my poverty and my wealth. Do not be arrogant when I am cast out upon the earth and you will find me in those that are to come. I am the one who has been hated everywhere and who has been loved everywhere. I am the one they call life and you have called death. I am the one whom they call law and you have called lawlessness. I am the one you have pursued and I am the one you have seized. I'm the one you have scattered and you have gathered me together. I am the one before whom you have been ashamed and you have been shameless to me. I'm the one who does not keep festival and I am she whose festivals are many. <clears throat> For I am the one who alone exists and I have no one who will judge me. For many are the pleasant forms which exist in innumerable sins and incontinencies and disgraceful passions and fleeting pleasures, which men embrace until they become sober and go to their resting place. And they will find me there and they will live and they will not die again. 